Hey, Real Life Church, thank you for joining us and watching Real Life Church Online. We are continuing our Shameless series and we are in week two. And Pastor Vince today is going to walk us through this concept of why do we hide in our shame? So I would encourage you to go ahead and get your notebook out or whatever you take your notes on as we walk through this today. He's going to be in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, and then he's going to cap it off towards the end with some verses in the New Testament that I encourage you to take note of as well. Uh, if you are jumping on for one of the first times here, or maybe you call Real Life Church home and you'd love to partner with us and give, there are several ways you can do that. You can text your dollar amount to 84321, or you can go to our website and click the Give tab as well. Uh, if you want to make sure that someone follows up with you, if you go to our website, there are plenty of options, whether you need someone in counseling and a care team to follow up with you, or if you want to get more information about next steps at Real Life Church, salvation, baptism, next tracks, welcome to Real Life, there are opportunities for that as well. So go to rlclive.com, click one of those headers, and we would love to walk with you in your next steps of life. But for now, let's jump into week two of Shameless with Pastor Vince. This morning. So here we go. So before we read in this passage, I want to give you a story. And, and uh, I've always said, since I've been pastoring now going on 23 years, and uh, be 20, yeah, be 23 years in, in April. And so um, I've been really blessed to get to do this. But I've always said that I want to take, and I want to take about six months off. You're like, so would I, Pastor Vince. I, I don't want to vacation for six months. I want to take six months off and I want to write a book. And I want to go around and I want to visit with pastors. And I want, I want the book, I, I already got a title for it. It's going to be called From the Pulpit. And in that book, I want to write about the wild and crazy things that pastors see from the pulpit. Because here's the reality. On a Sunday morning, I don't know what we got in here, maybe 300 people in this service, had about 400 in the last service in this room, and you all looking at me. Well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I am looking at all of you. And some of y'all do some weird stuff on Sunday mornings. You scratch your ear. And then you look at your finger, it's a little weird, okay? Uh, and so I wanted to just some time because there's been some crazy, my, my dad one time preached a sermon at a church camp and this was the kind of church camp we didn't have uh, air conditioning in what they called the tabernacle. How many of you grew up going to church camp and they didn't call it the chapel because you were in the wilderness, they called it the tabernacle. And so we went to the tabernacle, but it had this old like wooden planks that you would prop open with a stick. All the students here in the front row feel like I'm from Little House on the Prairie now talking about, they're like, did you ride your covered wagon there, Pastor Vince? Um, but so my dad's preaching one, one day at church camp and he is man letting it go, preaching, got hot, got sweaty and preached and he went like this and the Bible slipped out of his hand and he threw it right out the window. <laughs> and he just kept on going. He's like, that's how y'all treat the word of God. And then, <laughs> and then a few minutes in, he looked right at me and he was like, and I was like, I gotcha. <laughs> I go get his Bible and bring it back to him. So like moments like that. So there was this, I, I, would, I started pastoring when I was really young. I was about 23 when I took my first church. And we had a fella in our church, and I gotta, I'm going to try to get through this story. His name was Ed. Ed's a good guy, big guy. Some of you have heard this story before, but it fits with the sermon. So Ed's kind of a big guy, older gentleman. One Sunday, he's sitting right over in this section. And we're sitting in church, and it's good. I'm preaching, and man, I was young. And this church, everybody in the church nearly had been a Christian longer than I was alive, okay? But man, they just let me preach, and I'd go preach my face off every Sunday. And they just, they were patient, and they were encouraging. Well, this one Sunday, I'm preaching, I'm ready, man. And I'm letting it go, and Ed starts to cough. <clears throat> he coughs, and I'm like, okay. Ed's got a little bit of a cough. And you guys don't think I hear that stuff. It's all there. I hear everything that happens in the service. I just got to keep the preaching part in the front of my brain and all the craziest stuff you do in the back of my brain. So I'm hearing Ed cough and Ed cough. And I walk to one side of the room. And then all of a sudden I hear it. <laughs> you really got something hung up. So he gets up, starts to walk out to the aisle, and gets right in the center of the aisle and goes, <laughs> cough. And just as he bent, the button on his pants went <laughs> And then, right here, his pants fell to the ground. <laughs> Any of y'all ever done the penguin walk? That's what Ed was trying to do, is the penguin walk. Now, the thing is, his pants, and I knew Ed, man, I felt bad for him, because I knew he really wanted to be at church that day, because he hurried to get here. Do you know how I know he hurried to get here? 
because he didn't have anything on under his pants <laughs> when they fell. And so I'm doing my best. And I started running to the other side of the stage. I'm like, hey, hey, I'm right over here. I may have done a cartwheel to get over here just so everybody was looking at me and I'm trying to preach, man. And so I start, I'm gripping and ripping. I'm, you know, preaching loud and shouting and, and all this. And all the time, poor Ed is over here. Listen, how many of you know there's gonna come a day in your life where you just don't care? <laughs> you can say what you wanna say and you just don't care. Well, luckily for me, Ed was there. So Ed is right here, and he is talking the entire time to his pants. He's going, come here, boys, come here. And he's trying to wiggle and get his pants up while he's walking out the back door. And he's, pants, come here, come here. Well, I'm still over here trying to do whatever I can, pulling rabbits out of hats and whatever to try to get... And there's a lady on the back row. Now, here's the thing. I got to see Ed from here. <laughs> Everybody from about y'all's row back seen him from everywhere else. And this lady, she was a snorter. Any snorters in the house? <laughs> she was a snorter. And so she just laid down in the back seat, <laughs> laid down in the seat, holding her nose. And as I'm preaching, I hear Ed talking to his pants and I hear this lady in the back row going, mm, mm, trying not to snort while she laughs. So he makes it out, thank God. And I'm, I'm exhausted because I've just been preaching. At the end of service, I come down, jump down from the, the, the stage. Deacon comes over to me, whoo, man, you just letting it go this morning. And I was like, yeah. He's like, I, man, you just... What in the world? And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> He's like, no, that was fire, Pastor Vince. What, what in the... And I'm like, Ed's pants <laughs> fell off. <laughs> this is the providence of God. He goes, are you serious? And I said, you didn't see it? He's like, no, I was in the sermon. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Nailed it. So we go to Pizza Hut or Pizza Inn because that's where we were at. And it was either Pizza Inn or the convenience store. That's where you went for lunch after church. And so we get to Pizza Inn and I go into Pizza Inn and the Methodist pastor's over here, the Baptist pastor over there, Pentecostal pastor over there because there's no one place else to eat lunch. So we're all there. We walk in, uh, Jennifer and I, two little kids at the time. We just had Vanessa and Kaylee walk in there. Ed is in the back corner. He goes, hey, Pastor Vince. I said, hey, Ed. I wasn't going to say anything. So he did. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry my pants fell off at church this morning. So as I'm walking past the preacher's tables, they're all like. And I'm like, oh, awesome. Here's the thing. Ed didn't care a bit. Now let's just talk for a second. How many of you that happened to you, you would never step foot in that church again? You're like, no, 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 I'm never leaving the house again. My pants fall off. That's just not going to happen. Ed, 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 telling the world, hey, britches fell. I'm good. Hope you're good. <laughs> so we deal with shame in interesting ways. We, we, most of us, we try to hide it. And Ed didn't try to hide it. He would just dealt with it. I, I dealt with it. And so shame does that. We see, I want to share this a little bit with you, is that we, we have this understanding of sin, and I want to give you the simplicity of sin. Before I do, I, I want to walk into this. Last week, I shared a chart with you, and it had all the different system, or the, the steps or the process of shame. And it starts with, I want to feel loved and accepted. And then when I don't get that, I become ashamed. And when I become ashamed, I tend to do something, and that's hide. I hide. Why? Because I'm ashamed. And so I hide it. I cover it up with bravado. I cover it up with not talking about it. Maybe I'll just cover it up. And we do this. Let me walk you through this because God set up a really simple system for sin. We'll use a simple illustration. So most of you know that 
if there's a stove in your house, that stove is hot and we don't touch hot things. But here's the simplicity of that. If the stove is on and you touch the stove, you go, ah, that's hot. I shouldn't do that again. That's sin, the system of sin. Here's something I know I shouldn't do, but if I do it, I have the opportunity to repent of it and move on from it. Like I can, God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I'm asking your forgiveness. I confess it. I repent of it. Moving on. That's the simplicity of sin. The problem is we don't just deal with sin. We deal with shame. And so there's something that's always added to sin that perpetuates shame in our life. And so what happens is if you have a child and they touch the stove and then all that child hears is, I cannot believe you touched the stove. What kind of person doesn't know the stove is hot? Why would you touch the stove? What kind of fill in the blank touches a hot stove? Now I don't know that I can leave you anywhere because who knows? You're going to touch something else that's hot. You're probably going to mess that up too. And then the shame gets attached to the sin. So instead of being able to go, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Moving on, we go, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, but I'm still an idiot for touching the stove. Some of you have been forgiven of the sin and you were still dragging the shame with you. And so shame attacks us at a couple different levels. First way that shame attacks us is in our competence. If someone wants to shame you, the first thing that they'll attack typically is your competence. They'll make you feel dumb. And you, you guys know people like this, no matter what you say, they're going to make you feel dumb for saying it. And that's their defense. They're just going to come across and maybe they're quick witted. And so they fire a shot at you just to make you feel less than. And then, then they, some people even have the gift of doing this with a look. They'll just look at you like, why would you say something like that? And immediately your head drops. And shame is now attached to the action that you did. And if you don't feel smart enough, chances are you're not going to engage in anything. Why? Because I just got told words or no words that my opinion didn't matter at all. Here's the reality. For some of you in the relationships that you have, some of you just need to fix your face. Some of you are like, did, did he just say? I did. Because you don't, you, you, most of the time you don't realize it. Most of the time you're not thinking, oh, let me figure out a way to make this person feel less than. That's not what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't know if that's a good idea. When in reality, you could say, hey, I'm not really sure that's a good idea. Can we talk through that? Instead you go, and you Hit com you hit competence. And when our competence is challenged, we immediately begin to feel less than. Second thing that hit gets hit is our value. The enemy wants to convince us that we're not valuable. Remember the story last week of the woman in adultery? She gets drugged into the temple by people that are calling her a prostitute, calling her an adulteress, calling her sinful, calling her all these things. And then Jesus, in the most critical moment, doesn't call her by any of those names. Why? Because the world was attaching value to this woman when God said, no, no, you need to understand your value is in what I named you, not what the world calls you. And I call you woman. Go and sin no more. I'm reminding you of your value in heaven. I'm reminding you of your value found in the cross. I'm reminding you, ladies in the house, some of you have allowed people to attach your value to an action or to something like that. Don't let them do that. Your value is found on a hill outside Jerusalem called Calvary. And that value that God gave you there is more than anything anyone could ever give you or show you. Don't fall into the trap of feeling less than because you didn't please someone else. That's not why you were put here. That's not why you were put here. So our competency, our value, lastly, our confidence. Scripture Aaron read in the first and second service when he came out earlier was that we can come boldly, we can come freely into this throne of God. We can come right to God with our stuff, with our issues, with our prayers. We can come boldly in that. But shame will attack our confidence to where we don't feel like we can boldly do anything. 
And the enemy convinces us. He deceives us into thinking that you don't have no place in the presence of God. You don't, know how, you don't have any weight. You can't bring anything to the table based on what you've been through, what you've done, who you've been. You can't come with confidence to God. You know why? Because you're still carrying that shame. Still bearing that baggage. So shame attacks us at these places. And I, I want to dive into this. It's the same scripture we read last week where it says Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. I'm going to give you this real quick, and then we're going to flip over, okay? Uh, chapter 2, verse 25 says, and they were naked and they felt no shame. Now, I wish we could get this. I wish we could understand it. But the reality is we, we, I don't know that we're ever going to comprehend a world in which we don't have to worry what the other person's thinking. But that's where they lived. There's not, I'm not worried about somebody judging me. I'm not worried about somebody thinking I'm less than. I'm not worried about somebody de decreasing my value. Why? Because I walk with God every day and every day God comes to me. He comes and walks in the cool of the evening and, and I don't have to feel less than because God is here. They were naked and they had no shame. Some of you right now in your world, because of the shame and this cycle that's happened in your life, we see this cycle happen in lives all the time. We, we, we've, I'm about to get in your lunch a little bit, okay? What we've done is we've said these generational curses. Let me tell you, every generational curse starts with a generational excuse. People say, well, my parents were this way, and, and so we're this way, and I guess my kids aren't going to have any other shot but to be this way. Why? Because they never caught a break, and my mom and dad never caught a break, so I'm probably not going to catch a break. Everybody else gets the stuff that they need, and I'm just left out. Why? Because those people are good, and I'm bad. Because they make good decisions, I make bad decisions. And we buy into that lie instead of going, God, do you have something different for me? God, do you have something more for me? Because I don't have to be this. We hide our shame in so many ways. Some people, whether it's a substance, whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever it is that, that you desire that makes you feel numb for a few minutes. It's all, all you're doing is hiding shame. I've talked with them. I've sat, sat with people that deal with addiction. I, what's, tell me, please, I don't understand. They said, because for this long I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything. I said, yeah, but it always comes back. When, when, when you come off the high, it always comes back. When you, when, it always comes back. Yeah, but, but, but for this long. And it happens with teenagers that are rebellious and are argumentative and they're fighting through stuff and they're fighting with you parents. And I some, some of your parents are like, I just don't know what to do with my kid. Love them. Love them. Yeah, but they're that. Yeah, so were you. And let me just shoot straight with you. I'm going I'm to be as straight as I can with you. If you don't believe that our kids face things differently than the way you and I faced them, you missed it. All the things that you and I wrestled with as teenagers, if I said it right now, how many of you are so thankful they didn't have camera phones back in your day? Yeah. Some of y'all just were reminded of your shame, weren't you? <laughs> And now, in a second, in an instant, this generation has access to not some things. They have access to everything. And I know some of you are like, well, you just take it all away from them. Let me back you up. And before you build a wall, let me teach you how to build a bridge. Instead of blocking everything in their world, teach them that there is something more valuable than anything that that can offer. Teach them that there are boundaries and lines that are there for their benefit. Instead of perpetuating this cultural, generational excuse of, well, it's just what happens. No, God's bigger than that stuff. Perfectionists hide it behind accomplishment so long as I, we all hide our shame. We bury it over and over and over again. So Adam and Eve are no different. They were naked and then they were ashamed. Then we jump into chapter three. We got this serpent thing that shows up. He's the deceiver and he's sitting there by the tree, in the tree. We don't know. None of you were there and your coloring book most likely got it wrong. But we know he was there and Adam and Eve are strolling around and the serpent comes up and goes, hey, you guys want to eat? I'm kind of hungry. Why don't you eat this? Oh, God said not to eat it. And he said, yeah, I know because God, God knows that if you eat it, you're going to be like him. 
See where comparison comes in? We still do it today, right? I don't have it like they have it. They have it better than I have it. And the serpent said, hey, I'm going to convince you that God has it better than you have it, but you can have it if you'll just do this. And so they did. They did. And we get down into chapter 3 into verse 8, and it says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They knew that they had been exposed. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. The cool of the day. God come down to talk with his folks like he did every day. I just want to hang out with them. I just want to be with them. I just want to, I just want to share some time with them. I want to be with them. And he came down and they were there, but they had hidden. And that's what it says. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. It's so crazy to me that we can read this story from however many years ago, ages ago, and we still do the same thing. In the moment we should have ran to God in our sin, we hide from him thinking that he doesn't know. We still do this thing. Adam and Eve were no different. They said, oh, now, no, God's going to see us. Now, I know for us, maybe it's hard, but Adam and Eve didn't know anybody else but God. And the enemy convinced him that he wouldn't want them like they were. So they hid. Just like you and I hide. And so we get this story in the Old Testament of them hiding. And so what happens in verse 21 of chapter 3? And here's what we believe. Here's, here's what we believe. We believe that if we step out of hiding with our shame, with our past, then God will condemn us. That God's going to judge us. That God's going to hate us. I'll tell you why we do that. I'm just going to be honest with you. We do that because as church people and as Christians, it's what we have done. It's what we have done. Any of y'all ever hear anything like you heard something about somebody and because you heard it from a reputable source, you went ahead and shared it with somebody else only to find out what you shared with somebody else wasn't true? Anybody ever do that? Liars. I appreciate that. Let me ask you the follow-up question. How many of you, once you found out it wasn't true, went back and apologized? Or did you just assume, well, it's gone now. We've moved past it. So if they're not bringing it up, I'm not going to, I'm really glad it's not true. But you were so glad what you heard in the first place, you had to share it. But you're really glad it's not true, but not glad enough to repent. Right? We do this. That's why, that's why, that's why we all hide our shame. It's because we're afraid if we bring it out, people aren't, they're not going to look at us and go, oh, I understand. Can I pray for you? No, that's not what we think they're going to do. We think they're going to look at us and go, wow. And then we think the moment we walk away, they're going to go, did you know? And we wonder. And so what happens to the church is we continue to hold on to our shame. We tend to hold on to our guilt. We continue to hold. We, we, again, we hold on to shame from a sin that we've repented of and God has forgiven. And we drag that shame right through the rest of our life with us. And I want you to catch this in the New Testament because what God does at the end of chapter three, it says, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and he clothed them. You say, why did he do that? They had fig leaf because God was setting up a principle. A principle that we are, we are going to see throughout the rest of Scripture. A principle that is so profound that we can't miss it here. The reason it was skin is because God is setting up a principle, and it's simply this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so God performed the first sacrifice. And he clothed Adam and Eve. He, here's what he did. See, they tried to hide themselves with their idea. But God came down and said, I'm going to clothe you myself. Don't forget that picture. 
So then we jump. We're going to jump way ahead now into the New Testament. Say why? Because I'm getting there about your shame. So we see this happen. And so in first Corinthians, or excuse me, second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21, it says this, for our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Here's the coat part again. Here's the jacket part again. Here's him covering us again. So God said, you that have sin, God, Jesus is going to take that sin and you can put it on him. Why? So that the righteousness that Jesus had, he would take and put it on you. And we switched garments. And Jesus took our sin to the cross. And he took our shame to the cross. Yeah, no, I understand he took the shame, but the sin. No, 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 keep reading. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. You don't have to flip there. Just write it down and come back to it later. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him. I love that. This is what he did for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross and scorned its shame. You know what he did for your sin? On the cross... Your sin was paid for. On the cross, your shame was taken care of. You don't have to carry it anymore. His death did both. Why? For the joy that was set before him. What's the joy set before him? You. You. It was you. It was you. It was your sin, and he took it. Why? Because he knew there was something in you worth saving. You say, Pastor Vince, I don't believe there's anything in me worth saving. Then aren't you glad it was him? Because he saw something in you. He still sees something in you. That's why you showed up today. You think you're here by accident? No. Well, somebody just invited me. I don't even know what the service was about. And yet here you are because since the Garden of Eden, he has been walking in your evening going, where are you? Where are you? Oh, I know what you're dealing with. I know the sin and the shame. I know all the baggage that you're carrying, but I'm still calling. I'm still asking, where are you? Because here's the thing. Shame and God play two different games. Here's what shame does for us. Shame's invitation says this. If you hide from God, you won't be condemned. Why? Because we're not going to bring it up. We're not going to talk about it. I know I was abused and I, I, you know, I just, it's just best if I don't talk about it. I don't share that with anybody. But yet every day the voice gets louder and louder and louder and louder in your head that you walk through something and you're alone. And God said, it's not good that you're alone. It wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be you and alone. No, see, shame says, don't tell God because then everyone will know. Jesus says it this way. Jesus says, come out of your hiding and let my grace heal you. Let my grace heal you. Let me give you this, another story in the New Testament. Peter and John, they're walking to the temple. And they get to the temple and there's a guy out front and the Bible says he's been lame for 38 years. And he's going, alms, alms. Just give me some, put some money in the cup. I just need some help to get through the day. And he came there every day. The Bible says he was dropped off at the gate every day. Why? Because he got just enough to get him through the day. Some of you come to church and you get just enough to get you through the week. You get just enough to get you over the hump of feeling bad. You get just enough to make, well, that was a really good sermon and I probably need to change some things. And then Monday starts and you forget it. Peter said, ho, ho, hold up. We're not going to help you. In fact, silver and gold, I don't have it. But what I do have, I'm going to give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. Because what's happened is you've got comfortable only being helped when the God of all creation desperately wants to heal you. Will you let him heal you? Will you step into this moment where God is going, it's okay if you bring your stuff that's not okay because then healing can start. And when healing starts and when healing takes place, everything changes. 
and you're not carrying the baggage anymore. You're not carrying the weight anymore. Here's what it says in 1 John. Verse 8, I'm going to pick this apart a little bit. It says, if we, if we say that we have no sin, then we, we lie to ourselves. We're just lying. Well, I, it's not that big a deal. I mean, I, I got some issues, but they're not big. I got some stuff, but it's not that bad. I got some things that I got to deal with, but it's, no, no. Call it what it is. If we say we have no sin, we're lying to ourselves. And the truth it's not in us. Well, Vince, I, I know if I say it, if I, if I confess it, if I bring it out, then you already said. People suck. They're going to call me. They're going to judge me on it. They're going to condemn me on it. They're going to call me names, and it's going to be bad. And I understand, but the problem is I know people suck. I'm one of them. I'm not perfect. But this verse wasn't written regarding me. It was re written regarding a God. And that God in the very next verse says, hold on, you want to know what you're going to get if you'll bring this to me? You want to know what I'm going to do if you'll bring this to me? You want to know the type of reaction you're going to get from a God? Is this, if, if we are faithful, excuse me, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's the cross. That's him enduring the cross. And... I'll cleanse you. I'll wipe it away. The shame, I'll wipe it away. The doubt, I'll wipe it away. He is faithful to cleanse us, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is again what happened at the cross. He bore my sin so that I could wear his righteousness and be healed. I want to ask you, I want you to bow with me, church. Nobody looking around. I asked you this last week, and I'm being serious with you this week. Please, no one looking around. This ain't going to be easy. Some weighty stuff people are wrestling with, weighty stuff people are dealing with. It's been a long time hiding for some of you. And I'm going to start it this way. I just want to simply ask you, if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Vince, I'm hiding stuff. I've got some baggage that, that's very real. I struggle with pornography. I struggle with addiction. I struggle with lying. I struggle with these kind of things. I struggle with this stuff in my life. And I don't really know if there's a safe place that I can talk about it. I don't know if there's a safe place that we can unpack it to where I can, I can get healed. And so I just try to move past it as best as I can. But it always comes back. Say, if, if that's you this morning, you say, Pastor Vince, I'm hiding stuff. I'm still hiding stuff. Would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? Yep, yep, come on, come on. It's okay. I'm not gonna come get you. I'm not gonna call you out. I just wanna remind you. I wanna remind you that God is standing at the door and he is knocking. And he's saying, I can, I can heal you. I, I can start the healing process in you. If you'll trust me, if you'll open the door, if you'll let me come in, if you'll allow me to walk with you, I can change your heart. I can change your attitude. I can change the baggage. I can change the stuff. I can make a difference if you'll trust me if you'll just trust me. And so I'm asking you right now, you say, Pastor Vince, uh, it's so I'm so tired of still carrying this around. Come on, this morning, right now, right now we give it away. Right now we accept healing and we jump over help. We skip help. I don't want you to get through today. I want you to get into tomorrow and the day after and the day after with the hand of Christ healing your life. If that's you this morning, you say, I'm ready. I'm ready to be healed. I'm ready to stop fighting this battle alone. I'm ready to step out. Then come on. Come on, step out of your seat. Slide down here. Come to an altar. Give it to God. Come on, there's people moving right now. You're not going to be by yourself. We're not going to leave you alone. But don't leave knowing that God is wanting to do something in your life. Don't leave knowing that the Spirit of God is resting on you right now going, come on. 
You don't have to be alone anymore. You don't have to be alone anymore. I got, a, I got something for you that's bigger than you. I, got, I can clean the past. I can clean the stuff. But you got to give it to me. You got to trust me enough to hand it to me. If that's you, come on. See what you're doing. Some of you, I'm watching you. Remember what I said? All of you are watching one and I am watching all of you. Some of you right now, you're sitting in your seat knowing, knowing that you need to move. You know it. You know it. Come on. Take a step. Take one step. The God of all creation, I promise We'll meet you on the second one. But you got to start. Come on. Pastor Vince, the people around me, they'll be so happy that you moved. And they will start praying immediately for you. That's what we should be, church. So come on. Don't sit there and wrestle with this when you know. Don't sit there and fight with this when you know. Down deep in your heart, you know. Come on. Come on. Listen, the only reason I'm extending this is because I know some of you are still dealing with this. Some of you are fighting in your seats right now, hanging on to so much weight, so much pain, so much past that you just don't think God is able. You've never trusted him with it. Come on. Come on, take a step. Get relief and get restored in the name of Jesus. Last call. I know it's not easy. I know it's actually borderline terrifying. It's terrifying to give this stuff to God, to give this stuff away, to be healed. Just take one step. Just one. Just one. Father, I love you. Jesus, in every service, there have been people moved. And God, it is my prayer that those that have come forward are wrestling through They're wrestling through this stuff. God, it is my prayer that those in their seats that are wrestling, God, I I see them. And I know your heart is that they would accept healing, but God, I pray that they would do that even in their seats, that they would pray this scripture, Lord, you promise us that if we confess our sins, God, I pray right now that there would be people in the seats going, God, I confess. God, I'm tired of carrying this weight. I'm tired of carrying the baggage. I'm tired of carrying the shame tired of being so exhausted from trying to figure out how to keep it all hidden. I'm tired. God, you promised that if we confess that you are faithful and you are just, you are faithful and you are just, that means you're going to do the right thing. And the right thing to you is forgiving us of our sins and cleansing us from all, all the stuff people know about, the stuff nobody knows about. You cleanse us of all of it. The stuff the world is going to mention and the stuff they may never know, but God, you cleanse it all. And so God, I pray that even in their seats, I pray there are people right now that today is the day that they give that to you and they accept you as the Lord and Savior of their life. And we'll give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.